I don't always tell jokes about chemistry, but when I do, it's periodically and on a table. Stay thirsty, my friends. That's right, today we're introducing the periodic table. Hit the theme. Ain't nothing but a chem thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break hey. this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shu Fu coming at ya. I'm your host Fu and with me as always is Shu. Shu know it. You know Shu, the periodic table really is the most important tool in a chemistry student's toolbox. P to the T, let's get started. Introduction to the periodic table, a lesson from the periodic table unit. Let's start with the history of how the periodic table was developed. Dmitry Mendeleev. Dmitry Mendeleev was a Russian chemist who is credited for organizing the first widely accepted periodic table. Although Mendeleev gets the bulk of the credit here, it's important to note that he was not the only scientist working on a periodic table at the time. He was organizing elements for a chemistry textbook he was writing in 1860. He listed all known elements on cards along with their properties and atomic masses. When the cards were arranged in order of increasing atomic mass, not increasing atomic number, he noticed that similar physical and chemical properties seemed to repeat at regular intervals. He put elements with similar properties in the same columns and the periodic table was born. Let's say we had a random assortment of numbered cards and I wanted to organize them. The first thing I think of doing is putting them in increasing numerical order. So I'm gonna start with the lowest, 0.6, then 1.0, let's see, 2.1, 2.8, 3.3, 5.6. This is much like the way that Mendeleev ordered elements in terms of increasing atomic mass. Now, I wanna add an extra level of organization. And one of the things I notice is that some of these cards look similar to one another. So I can continue going in numerical order, but now I can make a new column with the yellow post-it notes together another column with the white index cards, and a last column with the large green index cards. So I'm still going in increasing um, numerical order, but now I have similar cards in the same columns. This is much like the way Mendeleev put elements with similar properties in the same groups. Because not all elements were discovered yet, there were many empty spaces in his periodic table. So for those blanks that Mendeleev left, those elements that weren't yet discovered, he used the prefix eka and the element that came above that blank spot. So for instance, gallium was not yet discovered at the time. Gallium falls right below aluminum on the periodic table, so Mendeleev called it eka aluminum, and eka is spelled E-K-A. He was able to predict the properties of undiscovered elements based on where they occurred on the periodic table. So as I mentioned before, Mendeleev really gets the bulk of the credit here for the periodic table, and this is because he was bold enough to make predictions about elements that he never saw, never touched, and were not yet discovered. As a matter of fact, when gallium eventually was discovered, its density was measured and published. Mendeleev read that publication and told that scientist that he was wrong. Now, Mendeleev never touched, saw, or measured the mass or volume of gallium before, but he was so certain in his prediction that he told the other scientists his density wasn't correct. And as a matter of fact, Mendeleev was correct. The only problem with this periodic table was that ordering elements by increasing atomic mass occasionally placed elements in the wrong group. You try number one. Using your reference tables, write down the symbols, atomic numbers, and atomic masses of two elements on the current periodic table that would be out of place on Mendeleev's periodic table. So what you're looking for are two elements next to each other where the atomic number is increasing, but the atomic mass is decreasing. And there are a number of different possibilities for your answers, so they will not necessarily all be the same. Henry Mosley. He was an English scientist who discovered in 1911 that the positive charge on the nucleus increases from one element to the next. Showed that elements should be arranged on the periodic table according to increasing atomic number, not atomic mass. This helped correct the discrepancies in Mendeleev's periodic table. The periodic law. I am the law! law. I never got the law! 
the periodic law. When elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, similar properties occur at certain intervals, groups. So what up with the word periodic? What does it mean? Have you heard of a periodical? It's a newspaper or magazine that's published weekly, monthly, but it's a set period of time that repeats over and over. No, never heard of that? Okay, what about the period of a pendulum swinging back and forth? There's a set time interval that it takes to go back and forth. No, didn't hear that either. All right, I didn't want to have to go here, but what about a monthly period? You know, like it comes every month. It's a set time interval. Let's talk about the setup of the periodic table. The periods are the rows going across the periodic table. The period number represents the principal energy level, or PEL, in which valence electrons are being filled. The number of protons and electrons also increases as you proceed across the period. Groups or families. These are the columns going down the periodic table. Elements in the same group have the same number of valence electrons. Because the number of valence electrons determines chemical reactivity, elements in the same group have similar chemical properties. For example, if we look at group one, all of the elements in group one have one valence electron. Because this is the electron that participates in chemical reactions, all the elements in group one react very similarly to one another. Classes of elements. Let's begin with the noble gases. The noble gases are the group 18 monatomic gases. Remember, monatomic means one atom. Because they have a full outer shell, they are chemically stable, meaning that they don't normally react. We call them inert. Other elements want to be like the noble gases and have a full shell of eight valence electrons. Now, while it's true for most elements of the periodic table to be full in their valence shell with eight electrons, it's important to remember that helium, being at the top of the noble gases, only has two in its outer shell. And remember, this is because helium only has one principal energy level, and that first principal energy level only needs two to be full. Xenon and krypton can be forced to react in certain situations with fluorine, so there are some noble gases that can react. Non-metals. These are the elements located to the right of the staircase. And the staircase is in bold on your periodic table. They may be solid, liquid, or gas. They include the diatomics, which include hydrogen, H2, O2, F2, Br2, I2, N2, and Cl2. Notice even amongst the diatomics, all three phases are present. Solids are commonly dull looking. This means they're not shiny. They're brittle. It means they break into pieces, like peanut brittle. They're poor conductors of heat and electricity. Within the category of nonmetals, there's a special group, group 17, called the halogens. Halogens gain electrons extremely easily and are thus very reactive, especially fluorine. This leads to them being diatomic molecules, as previously mentioned. So we can't finish talking about the nonmetals unless we talk about allotropes. Allotropes are different forms of an element. They have different molecular structures, which leads to different properties. So what this means is it's the same element, just put together differently. So some examples include oxygen as O2, diatomic oxygen, or O3 as triatomic oxygen, which is ozone. Another example would be carbon as a diamond or carbon as graphite, like in a pencil. Let's take a look at these two pictures. In the upper right, we see oxygen as an atom, and then we see diatomic oxygen, two atoms connected, followed by ozone, which is triatomic, three atoms of oxygen, which are connected. Ozone is poisonous to us, oxygen we breathe. So different structures, different properties. If we look at the diamond and the graphite, diamond has sort of a 3D arrangement of carbon atoms, whereas graphite has more of a 2D structure with sheets of carbon atoms bonded to one another. So even though they're both made of carbon atoms, you're not gonna wanna get down on one knee someday for that special someone with the tip of a pencil. 
Let's talk about metals. Metals are the elements located to the left of the staircase in bold on your periodic table. Two thirds of all elements are metals. They're found as solids, except for mercury, which is a liquid. They're shiny, or we say they have luster or are lustrous. They can be pounded into sheets, which we call malleability. Like the word mallet, pound into sheets. We say the metal is malleable. They can also be drawn into wire. Ductility, we say the metal is ductile. They're also good conductors of heat and electricity. Groups one and two. The alkali metals, which are group one, and the alkaline earth metals, group two, lose electrons extremely easily and are thus very reactive. Since they are so reactive, they are rarely found in nature as pure elements. Instead, they are found already reacted in the form of compounds. Let's say you were mining for sodium. You're not gonna find any. There's no sodium that you can find in a mine. You can find lots of sodium chloride because the sodium has already reacted with chlorine to form NaCl. Also within the metals, we have groups three through 12. The transition metals. The transition metals can lose varying numbers of electrons and thus have different ion charges or oxidation states. They have colored ions when found in solution based on these charges. Colored ion solutions is a distinguishing characteristic of these transition metals. If you take sodium chloride, table salt, it has sodium ions in it. Now that's group one. Sodium ions, when you put them into water, you get a colorless solution. But if you take any element from the transition metals, you take their salt or their ions, and you put them in solution, you'll get colored solutions. Now, for example, iron, if you put it into water, and you get iron ions, you can get a red solution or a reddish orange solution, depending on its oxidation state. Copper will give you greens and blues, depending on its oxidation state. Manganese is purple. The metalloids, the top five and bottom middle two elements found on the staircase. Or in other words, it's all the elements that have a bold line border for their box that are touching that staircase, except for two. That would be aluminum and polonium. They have properties of both metals and non-metals. They're sometimes called semi-metals, are often semiconductors. For example, silicon is used in microchips and germanium is used in diodes, both of which are used in many of the modern electronic devices that you use every day. You try number two. List the chemical symbols of all the metalloids. Use your periodic table. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode on the periodic table. It's been emotional. Promotional consideration is provided by... Pilk. It's the Loinkful. <laughs> but we never off, but we zone to the brick of dawn. S-E-I-E-N-C-E -E -E in the hall they call S-Wing. You know we never wear a tie like my homies, boys, two men. It's so hard to say goodbye. Like this, that. This and a, it's like that and like this and like that and a, it's like this. You're going in low power mode. Plug in chill to the next episode.